Let us now try to work our way into the concerns of that more than half of economics called microeconomics. If an intelligence not us, an intelligence vast and from elsewhere, whether cool and unsympathetic or warm and sympathetic, were to take a look at the human race, what would it see? It would see the very basics. It would see that we are mammals, that we are mammals with an upright posture, that even though we have four limbs, we use only two of them for locomotion. And it would see that there are an awful lot of us, 7.2 billion right now, and headed upward for at least 9 and probably 10 billion come the middle of this century. It would also see that we have hands and opposable thumbs to manipulate nature. It would see that we have and use big brains, and in fact spend about a third of our energy making them work. And it would see that we would talk, and talk incessantly and a lot of time talk even when it is not to our individual interest to do so. We can't help ourselves. As far as our behavior is concerned, our propensity to gossip, and thus to turn ourselves into an anthology intelligence. What one of us knows, very quickly, everyone else who needs to know will know. What good idea one of us has, very quickly, it will be as if the others had thought of it as well. That propensity to gossip is perhaps the most remarkable. Although if said intelligence were to look at cable TV or at the grocery store checkout line, it would quickly conclude that we gossip about three things. About sources of food and other resources. About threats, especially threats of violent death to young children and about mating and social relationships thereto attaching. The observer would see that we alter our environment on a large scale, so that by now we have spread very far indeed from our original range on the East African plains. It would see that we engage in gift exchange. While apes appear to maintain the social bonds that connect the group by grooming each other and eating the small parasites found thereby, while dogs appear to reinforce and maintain their social bonds by, um, we appear to maintain our social bonds by placing each other under obligations and then meeting them, by accepting gifts and then feeling guilty and under some kind of obligation to repay in kind. Last, an observer from elsewhere would see that we have a large-scale social division of labor. We do very different things with our time as far as making our collective living is concerned. And yet we don't keep what we make for ourselves, but instead somehow we share it. And the observer would say that these last two are connected gift exchange, and the social division of labor go together. And that, at bottom, is microeconomics. In fact, is there anything we cannot turn into a reciprocal gift exchange relationship? Any human interaction that cannot and does not fall into that form? Consider the Homer's Iliad. At the start of the Iliad, High King Agamemnon of Greece, of the Achaeans, takes Achilles' slave concubine Briseis for his own. Achilles sulks in his tent rather than fight in the Trojan War. Trojan Prince Hector then kills Achilles' best friend Patroclus, and then Achilles kills Hector, and then... And then Hector's father, King Priam, comes out of Troy, bringing gifts to Achilles to ransom Hector's body so he can take Hector's body back to Troy to bury it. The two of them cry together. They feast together. They hug each other. They compliment each other. Priam gives Achilles the treasure. Achilles gives Priam his son's body. And, just to make the deal sweeter, a twelve-day truce for the funeral games of Hector the horse tamer. Now, if even your relationship with your son's killer gets turned into a reciprocal gift exchange relationship in which you make each other compliments, then human beings do have, as Adam Smith said, 
a natural propensity to truck, barter, and exchange things, a propensity to enter into gift exchange relationships that is very strong indeed. And as it is on top of this social propensity to exchange that we build our market economy, our social division of labor, our transformation of our environment to suit our own purposes, etc. Turning our social solidarity gift exchange propensity into a collective tool for managing our social division of labor is the most convenient way to solve our economic problem. What is our economic problem? It is that we need stuff, or find that it would be convenient to have stuff, or simply want stuff, and we cannot make and acquire all the stuff we want on our own. We need to specialize in tasks in order to get a not insanely low level of productivity. Yet once we have specialized in tasks, what each of us can make is a much larger quantity of that particular task's output than we could possibly consume or use, and yet is a very small portion of the extraordinary array of things that we want and need. Could it be that our collective social division of labor makes enough of everything? That everyone makes what they want, specializing in the task they like most, takes it down to the warehouse, leaves it there, and everybody comes in, signs it out, and takes it off and needs it when they want to? Could we run a society in which everyone voluntarily and gloriously contributes to the economy what they want to make? That things are, as the man said, from each according to his or her ability, and that everyone then takes from that common store, that things are, as the man said, to each according to his or her need? Yes, we can imagine a society in which our productivity is so high and our degree of specialization so great that it turns out that nothing is scarce. But now that is not the world we live in, and that is not the world we are likely to live in. Because right now a huge number of things are scarce. And we are good at thinking up new things to make and do that are hard to do and thus scarce. And wherever there is no scarcity, there is no focus of effort and no concern and no problem. But where there is scarcity, there is concern, there is focus of effort, there is a problem there is the question of how are we going to arrange things so that as much of the scarce stuff that there can be is made and who is going to get it. And that is the domain of the economy of economics. Economics doesn't concern itself with that part of social life and commodity creation in which things are not scarce. It rather concerns itself with those areas where things are. And where there is scarcity, and where we care about scarcity, there is an economic problem. Do you want to think further about the moral philosophical foundations of scarcity and the fact that we, individually and collectively, have then to choose what we're going to do in order to try to resolve and to manage this scarcity? If so, I have two suggestions for things that you can read. The first is Oregon's Ursula Kroeber Le Guin's novel, The Dispossessed, a science fiction novel about a planet of humanoids, much like our own, and its moon colonized by anarchists, who truly work as hard as they can to create a society in which there is no scarcity, and in which everyone joyously contributes to the common store what they make as they go about doing what they like and everyone takes from the common store what they need and how it goes wrong or does it. Second, a report I ran across more than a decade ago of an interview with Rolling Stone magazine founder Jan Wenner. As it was reported to me, quote, I had a fascinating conversation recently with Jan Wenner, the founder of Rolling Stone. 
Here's a guy who's probably got three or four hundred million dollars. He's got a Gulfstream II and a house here and a house there, and you can't imagine what trappings he would want from the next level. But he's got this gleam in his eye, because he's telling me about how he spent the weekend with Paul Allen, the Microsoft founder. He said that Paul Allen didn't have a Gulfstream II, he had two 757s. They flew over to Lake Nice, and then they got into Paul's helicopter, which took them to Paul's boat, which stays sort of off the coast of southern France, and I could tell that Jan was picturing himself at the next level, the multi-billionaire, and I was fascinated by that because, holy, if that's not enough for Jan, why do I think I'm going to be able to get off the conveyor belt, unquote. Good questions. Looking at the relatively developing prosperity of his day, it was in 1776 the Scottish moral philosopher published his Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, in which he had his game-changing insight into just how it is their propensity to exchange gifts with each other and enter into obligations under such relationships reinforces with the enormous potential productivity of a finely divided social division of labor, to create the possibility for a prosperous economy. And, miraculously, such a prosperous economy doesn't require the government to do very much. As Adam Smith wrote, all you need is tolerable administration of justice, peace, and easy taxes, and then, probably, you'll wind up with a well-functioning and relatively rich economy if you just let people exchange things. Now, you have to provide property rights and property protections. People have to be confident that what they have is theirs, and they don't need to spend all their time guarding it from against others, or spend all their time stealing stuff from others. You have to have contract law, People have to be confident that whatever exchanges and deals they enter into will in fact be carried through. That is the tolerable administration of justice part. You have to have peace. Soldiers can't be burning everything, killing everyone, and blowing things up. You have to have easy taxes. If the government taxes too much, you'll find you don't have a productive division of labor, but instead a poor society with a lot of tax evasion. There has to be a fair division of wealth, an economy that is highly productive, but in which all of the wealth flows to a narrow few is hardly a prosperous one, is it? And the goods and services that the market economy induces people to make have to be genuine goods and services. They cannot be things that have dire and destructive consequences and effects on other people who are not part of the production process or the exchange bargain but set things up so that these are the foundations of a market economy, and we find that running our entire social division of labor off of this expansion and modification and development of our propensity to enter into gift exchange relationships works quite well indeed. Remarkably well. How remarkably well? Well, as a result of the unfortunate history of the 20th century, we can tell. In the 20th century, at least a third of humanity undertook the large-scale social experiment of seeing if you could run a prosperous economy without relying on the market system, without relying on exchange prices and trading in order to manage the social division of labor. That was world communism, high Stalinist central planning. Karl Marx was very suspicious of markets as surplus extraction devices, as ways of making the rich richer, and yet also convincing the poor that somehow everything was fair. And the communists who took Marx's writings as the sacred texts of their world religion said as a result, we won't have any markets as we try to build a utopia. What will we do instead to organize our economy? That was a hard question. Russian communist Vladimir Lenin resolved it by saying that the communists would reproduce the Rathenau Ludendorff World War I Imperial German War Economy. The mechanism of command and control built along authoritarian lines that Imperial Germany had constructed to try to keep the supplies flowing to the front 
from 1914 to 1918. So you had the elimination of individual farms. You had the gathering of farmers into communes. You had the construction of the largest possible factories to obtain the greatest possible economies of scale. You had bureaucrats in Moscow trying to decide and to command exactly which commodities should flow where at what times to keep production running smoothly. And the net effect was not good. The net effect was to throw away a five-fold amplification of productivity when you tried to do things by not using the market at all. The boundary between the communist and the non-communist parts of the world were determined in the end not by economics but by the luck of politics and war. Where Stalin's armies marched after World War II, where Mao's armies marched in the late 1940s and early 1950s, where insurgencies in Southeast Asia were successful as opposed to nearby places with even stronger communist parties where they were suppressed and exterminated, plus Fidel Castro's decision to turn the broad front Cuban revolutionary movement into a narrow Stalinist dictatorship, those were the communist countries of the world up until the fall of communism in 1990. And when world communism fell in 1990, we could walk around the edge of what we used to call the Iron Curtain and see inside and out it economies that had been very, very similar before the advent of communist rule, but that were, as of 1990, very, very different indeed. We had South Korea more than ten times as rich as North Korea. The North Korean regime has since survived without changing its course and continuing its unique combination of high Stalinism, absolute monarchy, and absolute theocracy. And right now, North Korea is perhaps one-thirtieth as well off as South Korea. China, in the late 1980s, before it fall changed its course and abandoned Stalinist Marxism and central planning, was perhaps one-twentieth as well-off as Taiwan, Vietnam one-fifth as well-off as the Philippines, Cambodia was less than one-tenth as well-off as Thailand, Soviet Georgia um, only one-fifth as well-off as Turkey, Russia itself was about one-tenth or perhaps a little more of the prosperity of Finland, Bulgaria had one-sixth the prosperity of Greece, and Yugoslavia had one-sixth the prosperity of Italy. Hungary, the gap between Hungary and Austria was about seven to one, and slightly more, eight to one, was the gap between the Czech Republic and West Germany. Poland was one-tenth as prosperous as Sweden, and Cuba was only about one-seventh as prosperous as Mexico. One, two, or even five economic disasters relative to their non-communist, non-Stalinist neighbors one could possibly explain away, but going ten for ten? Getting rid of the market economy was a really bad idea that robbed countries of at least 80% of their potential economic productivity in the central years of the 20th century. One reason that high communism was so disastrous an economic system was simply that it attempted to coordinate too much. That after all, if you have a market economy, a market economy with N commodities, in order to successfully coordinate economic activity, all you have to do is find a whiteboard, write down the N prices at which goods and services will exchange for each other after properly calculating what the prices are, and that let simply let things rip, let people do what they want, let things be. The French phrase, laissez-faire. And, magically, it turns out that you don't have to calculate the prices beforehand. You can let the market calculate them for you. By contrast, in a central planning economy with N commodities, if you want to maintain it via bureaucratic command and control hierarchy, you have to, one, tell everybody what to do, two, tell everybody what they are going to consume, and three, check up to make sure everybody is doing what they are supposed to be doing. The administration load is immense, and there is nothing 
in the system to tell you whether you are on the right track or not. There is nothing to tell the central planners, the general secretary who bosses them, whether their plan is even attainable or will lead to large-scale famine, like China during the Great Leap Forward. There is nothing in the way the plan is constructed to push the system toward productive efficiency, toward having the right people making the right things, and allocative efficiency. People saying, I don't want this, I really want that instead. That is also something that a central planning economy does not have pressures to produce. So such a central planning system automatically falls down on the first three requirements of any societal calculating mechanism we construct to manage our division of labor. But there is a fourth requirement, will it be fair? And at that fourth requirement, the market economy falls down as badly along that requirement as central planning economies do along the other three. There is nothing in a market economy that pushes it to come up with a fair distribution of anything. In the textbook, Krugman and Wells have their own take on this naughty set of issues. They attempt to summarize it in a few principles of thought about economics, how we are to understand the most important points that are the product of the discipline of economics. The principles they set forward seem to me to fall into three groups. The first are the principles of individual decision-making. The first principle is that because resources are scarce, people must make choices both individually and collectively. And what if resources aren't scarce? Well, we'll focus our attention on that area of life in which resources are scarce and say the rest is outside the boundary of economics. The second principle is opportunity cost. When trying to figure out how a item's cost enters into rational decision-making, you have to consider that there are always other options and that the real cost of an item is not what it says on whatever sticker is attached to it, but rather what choosing to perform the task needed to obtain that particular item means you cannot do with that time, with that energy, with that resources. The third principle is that economics has a lot of how much decisions, and how much decisions inevitably involve making decisions at the margin. Are we going to do a little more of this or a little less of that? It's never all or nothing. It's usually marginal adjustments, and so you have to think in marginal terms. This is very important in explaining things like the diamonds and water paradox. Diamonds in the marketplace have immense value, water has a low one. Yet, without diamonds, we wouldn't mind things very much. Without water, we would die. But at the margin, there is virtually nobody who finds themselves enormously short of water and hence willing to pay a lot of resources in order to get more, while there are some people who at the margin really value diamonds and have the resources to pay a lot for them. Fourth, people usually respond to material incentives. People usually exploit opportunities to make themselves better off. That means that if you want to induce people to cooperate with you, it's a good idea to find a way to set up things so that it is in their material interest to do so. And conversely, if you want to be better off materially, it is probably a good thing for you to respond to incentives yourself. This doesn't mean that people always respond to material incentives, or always should respond to material incentives, or don't respond to anything else. But, as Adam Smith wrote, man has almost constant occasion for the help of his brethren, and it is in vain for him to expect it from their benevolence only. Stress the only. You can rely on people's benevolence for social cooperation to some degree, but you should not rely on benevolence only. You should set things up so that doing good is also doing well. Those are the first principles, principles of individual decision-making, and you will note that, as often happens with economists, 
they kind of slide back and forth between what people do do, both individually and collectively, and what people ought to do if they want to accomplish their purposes. The second set of principles are the principles of social interactions. The first is that there are gains from trade. Once again, as Adam Smith said, in civilized society, Mihan stands at all times in need of the cooperation and assistance of great multitudes. We need the higher productivity from the division of labor and the cooperation in exchange that comes from that in order to pursue our lives the way we want to. And yet, we have to rely on trade, on gift exchange, to get things. Because, as Adam Smith says, it's impractical to attempt to do it by begging. Second, resources ought to be used as efficiently as possible. That is, when things are scarce, we really shouldn't waste stuff. Note that this especially is an ought rather than an is principle. This is a command, an injunction as to how we should behave as a group, not a description of how we do. Third is that markets move toward equilibrium. That is, if things are of a low price, and if as a result demand is greater than supply, and a bunch of people who go to the marketplace find themselves disappointed and coming home empty-handed, that is not an equilibrium. That is not a pattern of social interaction that can persist. But when there is excess demand, some of the demanders who go home empty-handed will be willing to outbid those who do succeed in purchasing, and the price will rise. Conversely, if the price is high, then supply will be great, demand will be small, a lot of suppliers will show up at the marketplace with goods and then go home having not sold them. And so some suppliers, seeking to get rid of their stock, will offer to sell for less, will undercut the market price, and the market price will fall. A situation of excess supply is also not a stable pattern of social interaction. Excess demand leads prices to rise, excess supply leads prices to fall. Only when supply and demand are balanced Will there be equilibrium, and will the price tend to stay constant over time? And at a place where supply equals demand, where quantity supplied equals quantity demanded, the market really is indeed in balance, in equilibrium. Everyone who expects to sell, sells. Everyone who expects to buy, buys. All do for about the prices they expect. Those who bought are happy with what they bought. Those who sell are happy that they sold. And those who don't sell are happy that they didn't sell. Um, If they were unhappy, they would have tried to undercut those who did sell. And those who don't buy are happy that they didn't buy. If they weren't happy, they would have tried to outbid the people who actually did buy. It is this pattern of automatic adjustment that simply having people buy and sell in a decentralized manner tends to lead to a sustainable pattern of social interaction in which everyone's expectations are satisfied and everyone regards themselves as having done themselves a good turn and gotten a good deal. That is the thing that makes the market economy such an effective societal calculation device for arranging our distribution of labor. Krugman and Wells' fourth principle is that market equilibrium usually leads to efficiency. Now this I don't understand. I would put it, market equilibrium leads to efficiency except when it doesn't, and that the business of economics is to divide the world into situations in which market equilibrium is efficient, that is, makes the best use of resources that can be, can be made, and situations in which market equilibrium isn't efficient. The point of economics is to arrange institutions so that as many market equilibria are efficient as efficient as possible, and when you discover that whole bunches of market equilibria are not efficient, what should the government then do about it? I would say market equilibrium can lead to efficiency 
and it is the business of government to make sure things are set up so that it does so as often as possible, and to try to fix and compensate things when it doesn't. But Paul and Robin, Krugman and Wells, set it out differently, and I think this leads to some confusion. The third group of their principles are what I regard as principles of macroeconomics, principles not of individual behavior, decision-making, and individual satisfaction of their wants and material desires, or principles of social interaction on the level of the individual marketplace, but principles of how to analyze the economy as a whole. Can it get stuck in a situation in which there are a lot of people who are eager and willing to work, but yet somehow cannot find a way to do so? Can it get stuck in a situation in which everyone's expectations are substantially disappointed because they can't buy what they thought they would be able to buy at anything like the prices they thought they would be able to buy them at? The answer to this in both cases is yes, but we're not going to talk about that for the next two months. We're not going to talk about that until after spring break. Thus, the macroeconomic principles that one person's spending is another person's income, that overall spending sometimes gets out of line with the economy's productive capacity, that when overall spending is running ahead of the economy's productive capacity, people get disappointed because of inflation, they find that they can't buy what they thought they'd be able to buy at the prices they thought they'd be able to buy it at, but go home instead disappointed from the marketplace, having had to pay much more, and that if overall spending gets out of line with the government to the economy's productive capacity on the low side, a lot of people are disappointed because they can't sell what they made or can't find anyone willing to pay them to work. And the last, that government policies can in fact change spending and bring the macroeconomy as a whole back into balance. Those are all very important principles of economics, but we won't talk about these until after spring break. For the next two months, we'll assume that people in aggregate want to spend their incomes today. We'll assume that those who want to spend less than their incomes are balanced by those who want to spend more. Thus, we'll assume that in the marketplace, on average, people don't go home disappointed, having had to pay more than they expected they would have to pay, and that anyone who actually goes to the trouble of finding a job and working at it then doesn't find by surprise that there is no demand for the products that they've made. As I said, that's a subject for after spring break, what happens when the macroeconomy as a whole breaks down. There are a number of principles that I would have included had I been writing the textbook that Krugman and Wells did not. The first comes from Money and Trust, from Partha Dasgupta's Economics, A Very Short Introduction. If we are going to run our social division of labor off of gift exchange in order to make it more productive, and we do, we do want to specialize, we have to trust our exchange partners. Without the institutional framework and setting of a market economy, without contract law and property rights and courts and adjudication and arbitration and perhaps most important money, our web of trust is very small. Without these institutions, the range of our web of those with whom we can enter into gift exchange relationships is confined to those other people who we know are good for the transaction and who we know will not attempt to welsh on the reciprocal obligation that they take on when they accept what we produce. We are thus limited to exchanging with kin, with immediate neighbors, and with close friends. By contrast, once we have property and contract law and most important money, then anyone we meet, even if we will never see them again, is a potential partner in a gift exchange relationship. Our web of economic life then immediately extends over the entire globe. There is, right now, some farmer in Sichuan who had a surplus of cash 
which they loaned to a young neighbor who wanted to move to Shenzhen to work in a factory for Foxconn, which Apple Computer then hired to assemble this iPad, which I then purchased. The guy in Sichuan thus trusted indirectly that I would be good for the deal, that I would reciprocate by paying for the iPad and thus paying him indirectly, the gift exchange relationship that he had entered in with me by committing his surplus cash to the iPhone iPad production process. And without government to establish weights and measures to provide money, um, to guarantee property rights, and to provide contract enforcement, what Adam Smith called tolerable administration of justice, there is no thin tie global network of exchange. There is no finely divided global division of labor. Instead, there are merely crude and unproductive, narrow divisions of labor between kin, immediate neighbors, and close friends. This is not to say that there are no threats to the money, property, contract, and weights of measure based global web of exchange. Positive and negative effective ties. People who give special deals to people they like or people who won't serve others at lunch counters. Destroy the global division of labor. Roving bandits who steal stuff make trade and exchange hard. Local notables who, like Don Corleone, make you an offer you can't refuse. Threaten to beat you up unless you enter into a gift exchange relationship with him on his terms which are, you give and he takes. And the government's own functionaries who use the government's own monopoly over the legitimate use of violence in a territory in order to turn themselves into powerful local notables. All these are powerful obstacles to the successful functioning of a prosperous market economy. Indeed, a government strong enough to support the market economy and yet weak enough to effectively stay out of the way, is a paradox. Anything strong enough to provide the underpinning of money, weights and measures, property rights, and contract enforcement, and also effective enough to control roving bandits and local notables, also gives its own functionaries and itself immense power. This may, in fact, be the reason why, in the historical record, economic prosperity and good governance is so rare. States and governments and those at the top of them are either too weak to do their job of supporting a prosperous market economy, or are strong enough to do the job, but not democratic and constrained enough to do the job rather than just taking stuff for themselves. So, to sum up, what the market system gets us what the market system gets us is that people can specialize in what they are most productive doing, and people can become more productive as they do. We can get an immensely fine-grained division of social labor, and that fine-grained division of societal labor makes us collectively an enormously wealthy and productive society. People can then enter into gift exchange relationships even with complete strangers via this institution called market, money, weights and measures, property law, contract law. And relative to whatever baseline you establish, decentralized market exchange with competition is win-win. Everyone sells what they make for more than it costs them to make it. Everyone buys things for less than they thought it was worth to acquire them. Everyone goes home happy. Market exchange maximizes wealth. At least it maximizes wealth as long as commodities are excludable, rival, known, and internal. And we will unpack what economists mean by those four words later on. Right now it would take us too long. The serpent in the garden, however, is distribution. Are we happy with the distribution of social power, of wealth, over command, and goods and services that the market economy gets us? 
there's nothing in the market system or its operation that guarantees or even pushes us toward making sure that is the case.